Okay, great. So, well, thank you everyone uh, for coming uh, to a talk at 2 a.m. in the morning. So, um, yeah, Emmanuel asked me to talk about the uh, magnet field um, and modeling work for Mercury and Saturn, but I, I think that it's quite appropriate actually to put Ganymede in this picture um, as well. So, uh, let me start uh, with showing you, uh, I'll show you this diagram uh, put together by uh, National Geographic a few years ago. And what's shown here are the uh, space missions that has visited uh, planetary bodies in the solar system other than the Earth. So each line represents a space mission. Um, on this diagram, you can see that uh, we have uh, sent many missions to the moon, to Mars, and to Venus, uh, but not so much to the outer planets. And only two to Mercury so far. Um, and our understanding of planetary magnetic field, um, with the exception of Jupiter, all came from um, space missions uh, that take in situ uh, magnetic field data. Um, we're continuing our observation uh, of the solar system, and we have uh, upcoming observations. Uh, one is Papi Colombo, um, it has been launched. Uh, in 2018, and it's now on its way, and it's uh, scheduled to arrive at Mercury in 2025, and then having a two-year survey there. And Baby Columbo consists of two spacecraft, and which hopefully would give us a much better understanding of the separation of the internal magnetic field and the external magnetic field at Mercury. Um, and on the outer planet side, we have the JUICE mission scheduled to launch next year. Um, it will uh, not only uh, visit the Jupiter system, but then we're orbiting uh, Jupiter's largest moon, Ganymede. Um, it will be the first spacecraft that orbiting an outer planet moon. Um, JUICE is scheduled to arrive at Jupiter system in 2031 and starting orbiting Ganymede in 2035. Um, I think 2025 and 2035 are not that far away. Uh, in the future. I think there are um, great upcoming opportunities to further study the magnetic fields of Mercury and Ganymede. Um, Ganymede, the largest moon of Jupiter, is actually slightly larger than the innermost planet Mercury. The radius of Mercury is 20, about 2,400 kilometers, and the radius of Ganymede is actually 2,600 kilometers. It's actually significantly larger. Um, while Mercury is mostly a iron core plus a thin mantle, you know. The structure of Ganymede is a lot more complicated. We think it's composed of an iron core, a rocky mantle, then on top of that, um, ice layers and uh, internal oceans. Um, and so, and comparing, uh, yeah, com uh, comparing uh, Mercury and Ganymede uh, is not just because they are relatively similar in size, uh, but because Ganymede is also the only moon in the solar system with a strong dipolar magnetic field, and we've measured them with the Galileo flybys, and we've measured them with the recent Juno flybys. And we have also observed aurora emissions uh, on the surface of Ganymede uh, with HST. HST. Um, so there are similarities more than just um, a first look, say they're similar in size. Uh, both Mercury and Ganymede are relatively slow rotators compared to that of the Earth. The rotation rate of uh, the rotation period of Mercury is about 60 Earth days, and the rotation period of Ganymede is like seven Earth days. Um, it's almost out of um, coincidence that the pressure inside their cores start almost at the same value. The pressure range inside Mercury's core is about between five and 40 gigapascal and the pressure inside the core of Ganymede is estimated to be six to 10 gigapascal. Yeah. So, you know, if you put, and they're all much smaller than the pressure uh, range inside the Earth core. So from that perspective, you know, comparing Mercury and Ganymede actually quite appropriate because we do expect similar material properties in their cores, at least near the, uh, near the outer core boundary. Um, and indeed that, you know, I think these, um, uh, a possible phenomenon called iron snow could be relevant for the course of Mercury and Ganymede. 
in which the iron gets nucleated uh, at the top of the core instead of the bottom of the core, and then they will get remailed, and then these remailed could drive convection, um, and then uh, they would further accumulate in the bottom and grow. So I mean, this idea of iron snow could be happening uh, uh, inside the cores of mercury and gamma. Um, a little bit of history. Um, Marina 10 uh, spacecraft discovered Mercury's relatively weak magnetic field in 1974. Um, Marina 10 did three flybys of Mercury in the first and the third flyby went close enough and observed Mercury's magnetic field directly. Um, but one of the surprises back then was that, well, Mercury's magnetic field is really weak. The surface actual dipole was estimated to be about 300 nanotesla. And this is only about 1% of that of the geomagnetic field. And if we compute the Alsace number for Mercury, it's like 10 to the minus 4, much smaller than the order of unity. Um, Knerny and Ness further pointed out that with the Marina 10 flybys, we can't really determine how big the Mercury's actual quadruple G20 is. Um, they've shown that they actually can be substantial, you know, on the same, same order of magnitude as that of the dipole. Um, but this weakness of Mercury's magnetic field is, is really a puzzle. Um, if we look at the paleomagnetic field in the solar system, say, you know, on Mars or Moon or um, Earth, you know, on their surface, um, for Moon and, and the Earth, you know, the paleomagnetic field on the same order of magnitude as that of the observed Earth Mercury's magnetic field is. And we don't know how strong the surface magnetization on Mars is. Um, we've measured them to be as strong as 250 nanotesla at you know, 185 kilometer altitude. And on the surface can be much stronger, can be a thousand nanotesla or more. So um, the Mercury's magnetic field as we measured isn't that different from some of the typical paleomagnetic field we've seen in the solar system. Um, we have a large number of hypotheses being put forward to explain Mercury's uh, weak magnetic field. Um, and here I try to list them, you know, crustal remnants in the non-uniform shell, uh, thermoelectric dynamo, uh, fixed shell or thin shell dynamo, um, deep dynamo under a stably stratified layer, iron snow dynamo or solar wind and magnospheric feedback. Um, I'm not gonna have time to go through all of them in detail, but let me try to highlight a few of them. Uh, since I think they are still quite relevant. Um, I think crustal remnants in a non-uniform shale is an interesting idea. Um, this was, um, uh, I think, uh, more quantitatively proposed by uh, Odette Harson. Um, and they show that if the uh, magnetized shale of this planetary body is not uniform in thickness, but has a variation in topology, and that can be translated directly into the remnant magnetic field that can be observed outside. So this is a way to get around the Runcon's theorem. And they also directly listed the connection between the uh, remnant magnetic field and then the topology of that being magnetized share. So, um, and they showed that, you know, with reasonable assumptions, maybe extreme assumptions, you can explain Mercury's magnetic field uh, uh, with, uh, uh, a, a crustal remnants. Um, and Uli in 2006 proposed a dynamo model under a relatively thick, stably stratified layer to explain the weakness of Mercury's magnetic field. So let me briefly explain uh, uh, what this model is about. So convection is confined to the lower half of the outer core while the outer half of the outer core is being kept as stably stratified. So this is using a co-density approach. Um, and in this model, within the dynamo, uh, active dynamo region itself, a highly non-dipolar magnetic field got generated as shown here on panel F. But with the electromagnetic uh, attenuation from the stably stratified layer, the magnetic field that's shown, uh, that's uh, went through to the surface of planet turns out to be much uh, larger length scale. And they can oscillate between a dipolar state and a quadrupolar state. So these two panels showing the magnetic field on the surface of the planet, but then on two different uh, 
time snapshot. And if you look at the magnetic energy spectrum shown here, the process shows the magnetic energy spectrum in the active dynamo region, while the circle shows the magnetic energy spectrum on the surface of the planet. So in the active dynamo region, you can see that we're almost dealing with a small scale dynamo in which the uh, energy peaks at about uh, uh, n equals to 10. And uh, what get through the stably stratified layer is mostly just the low degree magnetic field, mostly the dipole field and the quadrupolar magnetic field. Uh, everything above got attenuated quite strong. Um, so with this model, you can explain uh, the relatively weak strengths of uh, the observed magnetic field of Mercury. Um, and the other idea, which I find quite interesting, is the solar wind uh, or magnetospheric feedback. So the idea is, if you look at the magnetopulse current that are caused by the interaction between the solar wind and the planetary magnetic field, and the magnetic field associated with this magnetopulse current is opposing the planetary field, mostly at high latitude and polar regions, and that constitute a negative feedback. So what uh, these authors have done is they run numerical dynamo 3D numerical dynamo simulations with magic, but add a negative feedback from the magneto post current. So they've started their simulation with an Alsace number of 10 to the minus four, a relatively weak seed field. And if you have no feedback um, in about 10 or eight magnetic diffusion time, uh, the magnetic field grows to about an Alsace of what, you know, a nominal uh, planetary mag oops, a nominal planetary magnetic field. Um, Why, if you add a um, feedback from the magneto pulse current, what happens is that this feedback can regulate the dynamo process so that the magnetic field of this uh, dynamo actually became weaker as a function of time and saturate at slightly lower than our Alsace number of 10 to the minus five, actually it's more or less like five, 10, 10 to the minus six. Um, it feels a bit like overkill in the sense that, you know, what ended up with this simulation is you get a magnetic field that's even weaker than that's observed uh, on the surface of Mercury. But this is an important um, issue, which I think needs to be clarified later because um, if such uh, solar wind and magnetospheric feedback is important, then maybe we don't need stable stratified layers to explain the, the strength of the uh, Mercury's magnetic field. Um, in this um, model that's published uh, prior to Messenger, um, that the soil wind feedback also slightly um, modifies the geometry of the uh, magnetic field, make the uh, degree three and degree five coefficient uh, more pronounced. Um, and what happens is that we, uh, after the uh, effort, try to explain Mercury's relatively weak magnetic field, we got an update about the Mercury's magnetic field geometry from the messenger mission. Um, messenger mission is the first mission that uh, ended orbiting planet Mercury. It's actually quite difficult to get into an orbit around Mercury, such a small planet at such close distance to the sun. Um, what the messenger's orbit is um, highly elliptical, much closer to the northern hemisphere um, uh, and much further away from the southern hemisphere. But what Messenger's uh, magnetic field observation showed is that the Mercury's large scale magnetic field is north south asymmetric. And the way this has been inferred is um, by observing the location of the magnetic equator of Mercury. Here, magnetic equator is just where the magnetic field becomes parallel to the spin axis. And what Messenger show consistently is that the location of the magnetic equator is being shifted northward by about 500 kilometers. Now remember that Mercury is a small planet, right? So this is almost 20% of the planetary radii and at all observed longitude. And this corresponding to a quadrupole to dipole ratio about 0.4. And if we then um, visualize the expected surface field strengths from a northward offset dipole, and this is what we got. So this is a field strength map uh, on the surface of Mercury. Um, here, blue shows weak field and red shows strong field. So 
And in this case, you can see that the uh, northern hemisphere is uh, three, about three times strong as the southern hemisphere in terms of uh, fuel strengths. Um, I do want to make a cautionary note about concluding that Mercury's internal magnetic field is highly axisymmetric. Um, just by looking at the distribution of the uh, observed magnetic equator positions, um, there are considerable no axisymmetry. Um, the magnetic equator positions do vary by 20% peak to peak. Um, however, we don't know if such variations are internal or external origin, because the variation shows a degree one pattern when organized as local time, which you would think more like resulting from interaction with the solar wind, but it also organized as a degree two pattern uh, as a function of the planetary longitude. So you can see peak at minus 90 and then peak at 90 degree when you just, uh, when you show it as a function of uh, in a body fixed frame. So we don't know the origin of these um, no axisymmetries. I mean, if they are entirely of external origin, then yes, the internal magnetic field of Mercury might be quite axisymmetric. But I don't think we have the data to say that yet. Um, so um, on that note, I do think that um, Betty Colombo with two spacecraft, one closer to Mercury, one further away, uh, would allow us, us to answer this question much better. Um, so after Messenger, you know, um, we got the situation that not only Mercury's magnetic field is relatively weak, but it's also north-south asymmetric. Um, we have three more hypotheses to explain Mercury's north-south asymmetric magnetic field. Um, spontaneous symmetry breaking from distributed buoyancy sources, uh, or north-south asymmetric uh, core mantle boundary heat flow, or spontaneous symmetry breaking result from double diffusive convection. Um, let me just briefly say, you know, the idea, sorry, let me briefly say like, um, these ideas really stem from some of the previous ideas that has been applied to the north-south asymmetric crustal magnetic field of Mars, um, and but then being applied uh, to Mercury. In terms of the north-south asymmetric CMB heat flow, I think it's a relatively straightforward idea, meaning if there is a stronger magnetic field in the Northern Hemisphere, um, that may just directly corresponding to there's a stronger heat flow in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, as a result, there is stronger convection in the Northern Hemisphere. So I think that's more like a laminar idea in a sense. Um, but then I think the two uh, work on spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, with a few more comments. Um, so in uh, the work we published in 2014, we showed that if you have a distributed buoyancy sources instead of a bottom-up driven buoyancy sources, then in a modest Rayleigh uh, with a modest Rayleigh number, we can get a solution where the magnetic field geometry looks quite like that of Mercury. However, the trick here is that we need to apply a Y20 CMB heat flow, meaning we have a heat flow that's slightly stronger in the equatorial region compared to at the polar regions. And what does what that does is really to help promote and stabilize this type of symmetry breaking. So what I'm trying to show you here is the uh, north-south asymmetry in the uh, zeta helicity as a function of Rayleigh number, of we, as we crank up the Rayleigh number. So um, the value shown on the uh, y-axis is really a non-dimensional number measuring the north-south uh, difference. So if it's zero, the north and south are the same. And if it's, and if it's, um, and if it's like 10%, that shows there's a 10% difference between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And what's interesting is that we see these type of um, symmetry breakings, even when we have uniform CMB heat flows. However, if you apply a slightly higher uh, heat flow in the equatorial plane, that ended up not only making the symmetry breaking stronger, but it also stabilized the magnetic field so that you don't have oscillatory solutions um, and you can have a stable symmetry breaking in one hemisphere with stable magnetic field. Um, it's also interesting that if you just reverse the heat flow pattern, meaning you have um, slightly lower heat flow in the equatorial region, but then higher heat flow in the um, polar regions that completely uh, kills this type of symmetry break. 
Um, uh, our model completely ignores the strengths of the matrix magnetic field. And because we do have the option of uh, using the solar wind feedback to regulate the field strengths. Um, I mean, Takashi in uh, et al. in 2018 published a model of self-regulating spontaneous symmetry breaking in a double diffusive convection. So their model, the setup are similar, in a sense, similar to what Uli has done in 2006. But they have um, done it in the double diffusive convection regime where they solved for both a temperature field and the compositional field. Um, so in their model, um, and what they call self-regulating means that this type of symmetry breaking um, in the axial helicity in particular really uh, only happens when the magnetic field had a feedback effect, I mean, the Lorentz force got included. If you turn off the Lorentz force, um, such type of symmetry breaking disappears. Um, in their model, uh, mercury-like solutions do require a particular combination of uh, thermal buoyancy and compositional buoyancy. Only in solutions where, uh, where they call the bottom-up regime, um, where here I'm just uh, reproducing one of their figures in the supplementary material, where the uh, background heat flux is shown using uh, the red, while the background composition of flux is shown uh, in blue. And only when you have these type of particular uh, forcings where the uh, composition of uh, buoyancy is being driven from below um, that you get mercury-like solutions. If you have uh, composition of buoyancy driven from above, top down, or like iron snow-like regimes that you do not get mercury-like solutions. And if you have snow layer somewhere in the middle of the um, of your outer core, um, you also do not get uh, mercury-like solutions. So these type of solutions seems to be quite sensitive to the particular combination of thermal buoyancy and composition of buoyancy. Um, let me now move on to uh, the situation of Ganymede. So Ganymede in the magnetic field is actually much stronger than that of mercury even on the surface. So here I'm trying to uh, simply list the observed part of their magnetic field. Um, uh, even on the planetary surface, the uh, dipole coefficient of Ganymede is like minus 700 nanotesla. Uh, but remember that Ganymede's um, metallic core is buried much deeper into the interior. And if we do the simple downward continuation, um, which should be much simpler than what Jeremy talked about for uh, Jupiter. Uh, the dipole coefficient when downward continued to Ganymede's core surface are really almost Earth-like. They're 70,000 nanotesla already. Um, so I don't think the, the Ganymede uh, magnetic field strength seems just to be that of a normal dynamo. Uh, we don't seem to have much trouble explaining that. Um, I think the contrast between the uh, magnetic field uh, of Ganymede and Mercury on their core surface are more extreme. Um, but we do need to keep in mind that uh, we have very limited spatial coverage by existing uh, observations at Ganymede. So here I'm trying to show you the uh, four flybys of Ganymede um, that we has an altitude less than 15,000, uh, 1500 kilometers. So these are the uh, three Galileo flybys, uh, G1, G2, G28, and then the latest uh, Juno flyby, PJ34. Um, if I display their trajectory um, uh, folded onto a two-dimensional plane, that uh, you can see that G28 is really the, ob the only orbit that uh, sampled Ganymede's magnetic field in the Southern Hemisphere. And the closest one we have, G2 actually, the closest point we have sampled Ganymede's magnetic field is all the way near the pole of Ganymede. And if we show the same trajectory on the uh, latitude longitude uh, projection, and you can see that uh, we have only sampled the uh, Ganymede's magnetic field at uh, two of the four quarters, right? We've only sampled this in the trailing hemisphere in the north and then the leading hemisphere uh, in the south. So. I think any uh, conclusion regarding uh, the uh, magnitude of Ganymede, their structures, uh, other than the dip dipole, probably should be taken uh, with quite a caution. Um, 
but uh, we Jews were going to uh, map the magnitude of Ganymede in unprecedented detail uh, in 2035. We have more than 800 orbits. Uh, that's uh, low altitude, less than 500 kilometer. Um, and we covered the entire surface of Ganymede more or less in a regular grade. So I think um, we should wait uh, till then uh, to argue in the observational sense what's the non dipolar contribution of uh, Ganymede magnet UR. Uh, but I think nonetheless, we can keep building models, um, numerical dynamo models for Ganymede, uh, such as this one built by uh, Uli in 2015, um, and Iron Snow. Dynamo, where the snow forming layer is stably stratified and convection is driven uh, below by the remelt. Um, here, Uli has mapped out um, the parameter regime as a function of the thickness of the iron snow forming layers. And uh, like of the uh, homogeneous dynamo, we can have dipolar, hemispheric, or mixed mode non dipolar solutions. And my view is that uh, for Ganymede, I think. Um, at least dipole or hemispherical solutions are both uh, are both possible, are still being admitted by the uh, available observations. Um, yeah, let me say a few words about Saturn before uh, concluding. Um, I think I think Michelle will talk more about Saturn, so let me just focus on one aspect. Um, and if we look at this uh, press release image put together by the Cassini mission of uh, near the end of mission, one thing about the magnetic field shown here is like magnetic axis nearly aligned with the uh, rotation axis, but uh, how nearly aligned. So here I'm trying to show you the our observational constraint on the dipole tilt of Saturn as a function of time. So what the latest Cassini data shows is that the uh, tilt of the dipole of Saturn, the misalignment between the magnetic and axis and the spin axis, um, is less than 0 0.007 degrees. Um, I also want to show you this data and um, show in a similar way as uh, the uh, Mercury data has been shown, shows the magnetic equator positions as a function of longitude. And the uh, blue, the open circle shows the Cassini observations. The peak to peak variations is less than like 30 kilometers. And the radius of Saturn is 60,000 kilometers. So this is like five part in 10, uh, in 10,000 variation in the very, in all the variations we have seen in the changes of function of longitude. And regardless whether you're talking about dipole degree one or degree two or degree three. And so Saturn's magnetic field is really very axisymmetric. Um, I think the origin of this very axisymmetric magnetic field is still a puzzle. Um, our classical image uh, proposed uh, by Dave Stevenson is that um, you know, a Halley marine layer uh, caused a stable stratification and they act as an electromagnetic filtering layer uh, that causing the magnetic field that's passing only the axisymmetric part passing through uh, while the active dynamo works in the metallic hydrogen layer. But I think What's challenging um, at present is the latest discovery of a very large diffuse core inside Saturn from a ring seismology. So this is work by Chris Mankovich and Jim Fuller. And what they show is that in order to explain some of the fine splitting of the normal modes uh, detected uh, through the uh, spiral density waves in the rings of Saturn, you need a large part of the interior of Saturn being stably stratified. So here's showing the, uh, their preferred uh, brown Weissala frequency uh, normalized to the dynamical frequency as a function of the radius uh, inside Saturn. Um, what they have shown, what they prefer is that almost the bottom 60% of Saturn are all stably, stratif uh, stably stratified. And that's usually where we think the active dynamo works and their model really pushes the active dynamo region to um, a very thin layer, maybe between 0.6 and 0.7, um, and then leaves no space for a stably stratified um, healing rain layer. Um, so let me try to conclude here by um, referring to two points I raised in my title, challenging opportunities. I think 
understanding the origin of planetary magnetic fields uh, remains challenging. I think part of the challenge stems from the lack of constraint on the interior state of the host planet. Um, for example, whether it's top-down versus bottom-up core freezing, um, is there stable stratification? Or what's the extent of the stable stratification? Um, on one hand, they gave us a lot of freedom to play with in the dynamo models, but uh, uh, on the other hand, it's very difficult to reach consensus uh, in many cases. Um, in the case of Mercury, like different dynamo hypotheses have been proposed to explain the weakness and the north-south asymmetry of Mercury's magnetic field, but convergence has not been reached. Um, in the particular case of Mercury, I think solar wind and magnetospheric feedback needs to be further investigated and clarified because it is an important aspect in our effort to try to explain Mercury's magnetic field. Um, do we actually need to use the dy uh, try to reproduce a weak magnetic field in the dynamo itself, or that can be taken care of by the solar wind feedback. Um, in terms of opportunities, I think that the Colombo and Juice offer a great opportunity to refine our knowledge of magnetic fields and the interiors of Mercury and Ganymede in the near future. And in terms of on a modeling front, the recent uh, 3D geodynamo models have achieved the relevant force balance regime and applying those to the planetary uh, dynamos uh, should open a new front. Um, and I would like to leave with two general questions. Um, the first is to what extent can we infer planetary interior conditions from the properties of the observed magnetic field? I think uh, Jeremy alluded to this as well. You know, will we be able to do that uh, when our understanding of the dynamo process is better? Uh, and also the second question I want to leave is that, to what extent can we predict the existence and the properties of exoplanetary magnetic field or the future evolution of the planetary magnetic field? Um, and sh should dynamo models I like uh, tools that we can uh, do this and to uh, at which point can, uh, can we do that? Uh, yeah, with that, I would like to conclude and thank you all for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much. I also, um, I should say that I, I plan to be here in person, but unfortunately couldn't make it and the, the timing of his talk. So thank you very much to you for uh, delivering your talk in the middle of the night. So uh, yeah. now we'll take some questions. Yes, thank you for uh, for the talk. Very nice. I want to ask what could be the key um, asymmetric elements to explain the axisymmetric Saturn uh, magnetic field? There should be one. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Could, could you repeat your question? Yeah. yeah uh, so you say that Saturn has a very axisymmetric field, but there should yeah. be some uh, asymmetric field. Not or at least non axisymmetric field uh, element to explain this field. Otherwise, it would be not sustainable, right? Well, I mean, I, I think I think we're 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 entering a very interesting question. Yeah, I mean, if we have a naive interpretation of Cowling's theorem, yes, I mean there has to be some non axisymmetry. Um, but the question is, uh, to what extent? Like, how big is non axisymmetry? And then. Do they have to be in the uh, observable? Like, right? how small uh, can uh, can the non axisymmetric part be? You know, can it be so small that they are actually below um, any observational uh, constraints? Um, I, I don't think we know we know the answer to that question. I think in most of the numerical dynamos being viewed, I think the level of non axisymmetry do exceeds the one we observed at Saturn. Um, but you know the numerical, uh, but uh, Dynamo has a, a vast parameter space. So I mean, I, I, we haven't, you know, we certainly haven't exhausted that parameter space. Um, does that answer part of your question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you.
questions? So this is a comment rather than a question, perhaps. Um, <laughs> people talk about stable stratification as though it were a very well-defined concept. In my opinion, it is not. There is a difference between talking about stable stratification arising from a compositional gradient um, that can only be modified through the very slow process of diffusion, which is the way the term is usually used, for example, in meteorology, versus the case where the stable stratification comes from a phase transition. And the reason why there's a difference is, of course, that if you have a phase transition, then you have a two-phase medium and you can have rapid transport of one component relative to another, for example, by making rain. Um, so the stable stratification that people talk about, I've talked about it myself, for helium rain is actually conceptually different from the stable stratification where you talk about a gradient in heavy element abundance, but no phase transition. Now, why am I making a big issue about this? I'm doing it for the following reason. In Chris Mankovich's work, which I know very well, um, the stable stratification arises through the need of the G modes to explain the ring seismology. That's the response of the body on a short time scale. And you can have a circumstance where the system behaves with a positive N squared, N being the buoyancy frequency, usually called Brunfossler frequency, you can have a positive N squared on a short time scale, but not on a long time scale. In other words, it's not actually a precisely defined parameter because you need to look at the actual physical process. Now, in the case of, of rain and phase transitions, this is actually a very complicated subject. Um, Tristan Guyot has worked on this. I've been involved in this recently. Um, and you can tell from that analysis that the response depends on the time scale of the perturbation. So that brings me finally <laughs> to something that Hal talked about, which some people think is a puzzle and may or may not be a puzzle. And that is in Chris Mankovich's work, he has stable stratification out to 0.6 of Saturn's radius. And the question is whether there's enough room in that model for dynamo generation in a region that is external to the so-called stable stratification. Um, and I would say two things about that. First, that it might in fact be possible. And so I'm not sure it's a serious problem. But the second point I would make is don't put too much weight on what Chris has done, because it's not a true inversion. It's a forward model. And it's based on this particular idea of how stable stratification works at high frequencies, as is relevant for seismology, and which may not apply if you want to understand how dynamo works. So I'm not at all sure that people should be so worried about this claimed a uh, problem that we have with Saturn, that the region where we want to run the dynamo is supposedly stably stratified. I don't think that's at all clear. Okay, thank you very much. So let's thanks Ao again. Okay, thank you, yes. Uh, 